Hello, and welcome to the KE Report. Shad and Corey here talking with Robert Sin, also known as Goldfinger on CEO.ca and CEO Technician on X, also writes for Energy and Gold under CEO Technician, and runs Goldfinger Capital on YouTube and on Substack. A man of mystery, a man of many (laughs) titles. Robert, it's great to have you on the show to get your thoughts. I want to just kick things off on a macro discussion. We've been looking at a lot of what's happening in the markets in an environment where we're seeing really everything go up, the general stock markets, crypto, the commodities. It's really a pretty bullish sentiment in a year that everybody thought we were going to see a recession and we'd have an economic contraction. So what is your take on what's driving the macro? Is it the Fed? Is it the growth in the economy? What do you think is behind all of this speculation in the markets? Thanks, Corey and Chad, for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's, It's always a pleasure to chat. You know, that's a big question. It's a tough question. It's like uh, trying to be God and trying to uh, know everything. And I'm definitely not God and I definitely don't know everything or not even close to everything. But I'll give it a, a shot. And I really do think that markets are front running central banks. The markets are seeing a lot of easing coming. And we, we have to not just focus on North America. The world is a big place and North America is actually a very small portion of it. Now, yes, the US capital markets are the biggest and the deepest. And so, yeah, they're very important. But I think there's a lot of things going on in Europe, in China, in Asia more broadly. And so there's a lot of stimulus coming from China in 2024. It's a a commitment that the government has made to stimulate their economy this year uh, and strengthen their economy. And we're seeing that show up in different ways, including in copper. There's a lot of copper stockpiling coming from China the last couple of months. It just sort of came out of nowhere in January. Their stockpiles were very low at the end of 2023, and they've really uh, done a lot of you know accumulation in, uh, of copper uh, so far in the first quarter of 2024. And, you know, the Fed is, is you know, save some extreme turnaround in the inflation data and a continually robust, uh, you know, labor market environment, the Fed is going to begin easing. And, you know, we don't know the exact timing of the cuts, but the cuts are coming. And the quantitative tightening is going to slow down very soon. And they and they spelled that out in Powell's press conference last week. So easing is coming. And markets are just amazing in the way they front run these things because, you know, you or I can sit here and be like, we really aren't sure there's going to be a rate cut in June. But the market is just saying, yeah, there's going to be three rate cuts in 2024. Don't worry about it. And the market has been wrong you know, consistently about the Fed rate cuts for the last year and a half. But market keeps pricing in rate cuts and it keeps driving uh, stocks higher. Um, But in our domain, which is mainly precious metals, gold and silver, I think a lot of it, a lot of the strength is coming from the East. Yeah, you're right, Robert. We, We have seen that a lot of that demand coming from the East. Just to follow up, though, on the market pricing in rate cuts, you are right. They are still pricing in rate cuts. But in all fairness, last year at some time, they were pricing in, I think, upwards of like seven rate cuts. Now that's down to three or four. The markets have just kept moving higher. Does it not really matter how many rate cuts the market is pricing in? It just more matters that the market is understanding that we're not going to get any more hikes. And the central banks really globally are going to move into this easing policy eventually. I think you're 100% spot on, Corey. You know, it doesn't matter so much exactly how many and the timing of it. It just matters that the tightening has concluded and the Fed is committed to easing and the Fed is trapped. We're in a situation of fiscal dominance now where government funding the U.S. government, the Treasury Department uh, actually matters more. And, you know, if you look at like the recent inflation prints, I mean, you know, let's say the last five CPI, PPI, PCE, they have been on the hotter side. I wouldn't say they've all been hot, but 
more prints have been hot than prints have been in line. So there, there's a sign, there's sign that inflation is kind of sticky. Yet Powell was very dovish in his testimony to Congress. He had a dovish tilt to his press conference last week. And he's not a dumb guy, and he's very careful in everything he says. It's very premeditated. So he's consciously choosing to turn more dovish in spite of inflation being sticky, maybe around 3% on the CPI. That's not at the target, you know? And so I think that's just a huge signal to markets that the Fed is really trapped here. And like if I were to script, what's the most bullish macro backdrop you could possibly have for gold? You know, let's say 12 different factors. I would say we've got nine or 10 of them lined up right now. You know, it's not nirvana, you know, which is a word I've been throwing around a little bit lately, but we're getting pretty close to nirvana. Robert, we actually are. We've got a gold price up at 2240. If you had backed up the clock in a time machine and told people a couple of years ago that gold will eventually break 2000 and be up in the 2200 plus area, a lot of people would have assumed we are in nirvana. Maybe not so much in the gold stocks, but let's start with the price of gold. You said a lot of people keep asking you, why, Robert? Why? Why is gold going up? And you had a great answer, and I'd love you to elaborate on it. It really doesn't matter because the reality is on the chart, it is going up. What is your technical outlook on gold? Does this move have enough momentum to keep stretching higher? What's the general take on the yellow metal? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. A lot of people, like I, you know, I tweet or, you know, I'm not even sure if that's the right word for it, you know, these days, because it's called X. But yeah, I post comments on X and a lot of people, you know, respond. And when I post gold charts pointing out, hey, we're making a new weekly all-time high. We're making a new monthly all-time high. In fact, today we just made a new monthly and quarterly all-time high for gold. And a lot of the comments are bearish or negative i don't trust it or the most common one is yeah but the gold stocks yeah but the gold stocks right and i'm like yeah but i'm posting a gold chart right so we're talking about the metal we're not talking about some gold miner and it's very important to clearly separate the two because they're they're quite a bit different as we've learned right And I look at gold price action the last few weeks, and this is, it's just, it's bull market. It's a bull market. This is how a bull market behaves. And we had that spike up to 2225. I think it was Wednesday night futures trading. And it came back down. It was kind of a short squeeze, you know, extended hours spike. It, It caught some shorts in the futures and forced them to cover. And then it came right back down to 2160 and a lot of bearish comments came out. See, oh, that's the blow off. You know, that's it. You know, the high is in at 2225. And like, nope, that's not it. Watch it settle, find its footing here in the 2160s and we'll work our way back up again. And that's exactly what it's, it's done this week. So it's, it's characteristic of a bull market. And you can ask why until you're blue in the face and you could try to explain it and make up theories. But at the end of the day, nobody knows everything that's driving the gold market. It's too big of a market. It's a global market. There's so many players. There's so many forces at work in gold. You just can't have all the answers. You just simply cannot. But the fact is there has been consistent. There has been steady and there has been relentless buying for many months, and it seems to have accelerated substantially in the month of March. It has. You are right. And look, just look at the chart, right? Gold has broken out and actually followed through, finally, on some of those highs. And yeah, you can try to put whatever reasons you want on it, but as you even said earlier on, too, there is a lot of Asian demand. It doesn't really matter where the demand comes from. It is moving price. But down into the stocks, though, because, look, a lot of investors, well, they like holding gold or they might like gold from an investment or capital appreciation purpose. They drive down into the stocks because those stocks are supposed to give them leverage. 
the smaller stocks have still continued to struggle, but some of the majors have really picked up steam after what was a pretty brutal three plus year period of them just moving lower and lower and lower as the gold price was holding up near all time highs. We have started to see some life in these majors as well as higher volume. What stood out to you, though, Robert, in terms of the underlying stocks, especially with some of the bigger players? Yeah, that's a great point. Well, first of all, the GDX rallied aggressively in early March, and then it proceeded to consolidate near $30 a share for a couple of weeks. So that was a high and tight consolidation that we like to see. And that is a characteristic of a bullish market or or stock, right? So the gold miners as a sector have been acting well. And then if we dig down into the, you know, specific stocks like AEM, KGC, IAG, right? These are either senior or mid-tier gold producers. AEM is making a new 52-week high today. And the last two trading sessions, it has had three, four percent moves higher on increasing volume. So we're seeing volume pick up as price accelerates to 52 week highs. Again, this is not complicated. This is textbook bull market price action in AEM. That's the third largest gold producer in the world. IAG is another one, 52 week highs today that's a mid-tier breaking out and if you look at the daily chart in iag high and tight consolidation it rallied aggressively late february early march proceeded to pull back about 10 percent in the middle of the month and now it has continued the uptrend higher making new highs so this is textbook bull market action across the gold mining sector not just in a handful of stocks, we're talking about in dozens of stocks and the bigger companies, the seniors, the mid-tiers are going to lead the sector. And then the juniors will always follow a month, two months, three months later. And I know a lot of your listeners are very skeptical because they've heard a lot of guests over the years talking that, oh, it's time for the juniors and it, it hasn't quite been. But it feels like the stars are aligning here in 2024. Well, Robert, I want to dig in on that theme a little bit more. We've talked about that, I think, till we're blue in the face, that you're not going to see the juniors move until you see the majors move and the mid-tiers move, and then it works its way down the risk curve. You've been through multiple cycles in the markets and have seen this before. I guess talk to those people that are the skeptical ones in this answer. The people that think, yeah, my junior's still not moving. Look at gold. It's breaking up to new highs, not just daily, weekly, but quarterly, monthly. When is this thing going to move? But maybe speak to them about how the natural flow happens in the resource sector. Well, you know, every cycle's a little bit different. But if we think back to, let's say, 2020 even, that was a very accelerated (laughs) cycle. But the larger miners turned at the end of March. So there was a crash, there was a rebound, there was a V bottom, it was actually more than a V bottom. And by early, mid-April, the gold mining sector was roaring higher, right? It was very bullish. Yet in April, 2020, a lot of juniors were very low on cash and they had basically just spent the last month shutting down due to the pandemic, right? And it took the juniors a month or two to get their footing and be like, oh, people actually want us to do stuff and people want to give us money. Oh, okay. Let's, let's do it. You know? And and so by let's say end of May, things started to really move up in the juniors, but the seniors had moved two months earlier. Right. So, so that's one example. Um, and this is this is similar. I don't think it will be quite as you know hyper accelerated as that 2020 thing was because that was like when every government and central bank poured 10 trillion dollars you know into the pool. But we might see something somewhat similar in that the seniors, like I just said, AEM making 52 week highs, 
IAG making 52 week highs. We might see the seniors really start to get the attention and especially like chartists, technicians, the algos, oh, gold miners breaking out to 52 week highs. So money starts to flow into the sector. And then maybe later in April or early May, juniors will be able to finance again. So some of these companies that have been kind of stuck in limbo that may have good management teams and quality projects, but they just didn't have the funds to really carry out a big exploration program summer of 2024, they may be able to finance by May, right? And then all of a sudden it's game on again, right? And, you know, attention and funds could start to flow down the food chain from the seniors to the mid tiers, finally to the juniors. And I'll make one more point. We have seen a steady consolidation in the gold mining sector in the last year. There's been a number of deals that have been announced. We just had another one announced a couple of days ago, right? A senior bought, uh, you know, mid-tier. And I think all of that is very positive. The, the number of companies in the sector is getting smaller, you know, slightly smaller. And the consolidation is overall quite healthy you know some of that money that the shareholders of the company that gets purchased will get recycled eventually right it takes time it's the deal doesn't close for three or four months normally so it takes some time it's a process but overall it's a healthy process and it's a good sign that corporates are seeing compelling valuations and they're willing to make deals Oh yeah, all M and A I think is good. Even though people complain about take unders, it does still free up capital, and we do need more consolidation and some better, I think, performance from some of these operators as well. But Robert, when we look at some of those majors that you highlighted, are at fifty-two week highs. Hopefully, that does bring in some more generalist money. Usually, the generalists though they do look at ETF. So how do you balance out? Some of those moves in the majors, which is not every major at 52 week highs and GDX, which really is just back to where it started the year. Yeah, I'm not I'm not really sure that stocks like Newmont and Barrick get on the, the, the screens of hedge funds and sort of those technical flows. So I don't think they necessarily always just buy the exchange traded fund. Although that, that is certainly a big driver of moves in the sector. But, you know, from a technician standpoint, I might see a bunch of individual names make new highs and they might be showing up on various technical screeners. And then I might be, you know, I need to allocate some money to that sector, right? Because maybe I'm not smart enough to pick the exact stock, but the sector is showing signs of strength. So let me just take, you know, just hypothetically, if I'm running a billion dollar fund, let me take 50 million and put it into the gold mining sector, right? And that money will work its way down the food chain. And then certainly you'll see the more micro funds who actually do specialize in the mining sector they'll be looking for alpha, right? And so, yeah, a bigger fund might need to send like 50 million or 100 million to a sector, but a smaller fund or a family office might, it could just be 2 million or 3 million. And that's enough to move a junior big time, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's enough capital to have a, a, a big impact in a $20 million stock, right? So that's, you know, that's kind of how it works. And I think that just as recently as February, so we are literally talking about a month ago, there was very little appetite to take new risk in the junior mining sector, right? So it is a process. We can't expect the risk on appetite to just turn on like a switch. It can turn on quickly as we've seen January, 2016, April, 2020, but, you know, give it a couple months, right? So I, I think we're still early in this move, especially when it comes to the juniors. 
Well, Robert, one more medal I got to ask you about is the other precious medal, the scrappy little brother of gold, silver. Um, <laughs> I always ask you about it. I, and last time I gave you a grief because you had, had put out those presentations at the MIF and at different places about the two metals you need, gold and copper. And when I asked you about silver, you said, I don't hate on silver, but you just aren't quite as animated by it. But when you look at silver, it has this bizarre nature where it's lagging gold for long periods of time during breakouts, and then it just blasts up higher. And there's obviously the silver mining stock. So just want to get your thoughts on silver and the silver stocks. Yeah, I mean, uh, some people have an obsession with silver because they've taken the, the red pill or the silver pill that it has to go up to $100 an ounce or $300 an ounce or something. And it's going to give them, you know, the, you know, these enormous gains in the future. And while, I mean, that's certainly possible, I don't have that kind of obsession. And while I, I do own some physical silver, I, you know, I don't obsess over it, but just looking at, so going back to gold and Nirvana, I think one of the, let's say those 12 elements that we need to get there Let's say we've got eight or nine lined up right now. We still three or four left to trigger. I would say the silver breakout above 26 on a confirmed weekly close above 26 would be number nine or 10 on that list to get to Nirvana. So we're not quite there yet, you know? And I think that especially for people who are more interested in juniors, Silver is something that you should be looking at. When that breakout really happens, I would expect the risk on and the juniors to get ratcheted up. Okay. Like, you know, silver is that poor man's, you know, <laughs> you know, version of gold, but it really does tell you that the precious metals are roaring when silver starts to, to outperform. And then, you know, looking at the silver weekly monthly charts the long-term charts look really healthy like really constructive and when that weekly breakout above 26 finally happens and it's for real it could be really powerful you know i'm not going to throw out any crazy price targets but silver could move up quite a bit you know once that breakout happens you've got a lot of blue sky between 26 and 30 but again you got to temper your expectations, right? Because if we're looking at a monthly chart, you know, it's not going to get there in, in, you know, in a week, right? So, so, so when the breakout happens and you're, you're like, okay, silver's going to 30. Well, it might take a couple of months. It might take three months. It's not going to happen overnight. But the fact is that silver is making uh, higher lows on multiple time frames, and it continues to test that $26 area. And I feel like the next time or the, the next two times, it's got it's got to get through it. Um, you know, so we're right on the cusp of a breakout in silver. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Robertson here weighing in on the macro side of the markets, gold, the gold mining stocks, majors, juniors, and even silver. Always great having you on the show. And if people want to follow along with Robert, we will put a couple different links to his X site to CEO.ca and to Goldfinger Capital on YouTube. Definitely follow along with all the work that he puts out in the markets, both technically and fundamentally. And as always, Robert, looking forward to our next conversation together. Thank you so much.